Welcome to another episode of Spilling Ink, the talk show that takes you behind the book to meet the authors and professionals in the publishing industry. We are back this week with two awesome authors to introduce you to, and our co-host Jason is back. We missed you, Jason. Hey guys, how's it going? I also have Bella, the dancing bird. Look at, she's almost on my, ah, <laughs> no, it's just an illusion. She was the star of the show last time. She was, uh, she was pretty good. Buddy the puppy this time, we're puppy sitting this week. Oh, hi buddy, how are you doing? This is his standard red-headed stepchild face. I don't know if you can see it or not. No. He, oh, he gives you the wow. nobody loves me look, especially when he's getting love. So sad. <laughs> <Aww>. <laughs> well, with us tonight, we have LJ Hockmeister. How's it going, LJ? I'm doing great. Thank you for having me. You're very welcome. And we also have Tina Henry. Hi, guys. <laughs> Hi, Tina. <laughs> oh, so how are you guys all doing tonight? Good. Good. Really good. Um, yeah, just uh, celebrating a belated birthday and hanging out with you guys. So well, happy Fantastic. birthday. Yeah, thank you. Awesome. How, now, how old are you? You're not supposed to ask oh, that, wait, Jason. Wait, wait. Sorry. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> well, old enough, uh, old enough now to be um, feeling aches and pains in the rain and stuff like that. So how about that? For me, that was like 30. <laughs> yep, a little bit older than that, but yep. <laughs> So LJ, do you write full time? Tell me a little bit about what you do. No, I actually am a nurse by day, um, okay. and I write, uh, and I also also teach martial arts. So, um, really? yeah, I'm not sure where sleep fits in there. It's in there somewhere, I'm sure. But uh, yeah, no, I I really like being a nurse. Oh, that's fantastic! Now, how long have you been a nurse? Uh, Fifteen years now. Yeah, okay. I absolutely love it. I think it keeps me pretty grounded, and. Uh, Certainly makes you appreciate your health on top of everything else. So. Oh, for sure, for sure. When did you start writing? Um, I've been writing ever since I was little. So um, I would. This is definitely going to date me, but I used to go down to my dad's office and uh, type stories on his typewriter. And Whoa! I know, I know. Um, and then I got more serious about it. A great outlet is a healthy outlet for you know. Um, I, I really struggled with being gay growing up, so it was a healthy outlet to kind of create alternate worlds and kind of play out what I needed to, to vent in those stories. And then I got more serious about it when I graduated college and I wrote my first novel. Um, it's this one right here, Trainer and Awakening. Uh, the first version uh, is should be burned. I still have it somewhere. But, uh, you know, it, it took, I don't know, I, I bet um, Tina can also attest to this it, and Katie, um, that it takes like 10 years before I think you really find your groove as a writer. Do, what do you think of what she just said there, Tina? I mean, how long did you, uh, did it take you to find your groove, so to speak? Well, I mean, I, I've also been writing since I was really, and it's really the only thing I was ever good at was like reading books and writing stories. So um, like it never occurred to me that I wouldn't be a writer because um, that was the only thing I ever really wanted to do. Um, I have no aptitude for anything else. <laughs> So, um, so I, um, I actually went to, um, I did my undergraduate degree in English. I did, um, a master's in fiction writing and then I got a, an, uh, I got an MFA in fiction writing and then I got a, an MA in the teaching of writing. And I thought that I would teach until, you know, I got published. And, um, but as I was finishing my second, uh, graduate degree, I got pregnant and um, so then when my son was born, um, I stayed home with him for two years. And then I was like, wait a second, I'm 34 and I want to be published before I'm 35, which was sort of a goal that I set for myself. So I sat down and I wrote my first book in six weeks. Holy cow. Wow. I'm really impressed. I'm really impressed. I'm sorry. That doesn't usually, I mean, it doesn't usually happen that way. And I always feel like I need to like have a caveat with my story because the first book you write isn't usually the first one that you publish. But I was really confident in that book. I was strangely confident in that book, actually. My husband always says, he was like, you were so sure that that book was going to be published. I was like, I don't know. I just thought it was publishable. Well, what was and the, what was your first one? Black Wings? I have it. So this oh, is, cool. um an urban fantasy series that I wrote. This was a seven book series that I wrote for Ace. And the first one actually came out seven years ago next month. Yeah. So congratulations. It, like it doesn't usually happen that way. So I always feel like I should tell people like it's I, I had an unusual situation. Like I got lucky the right person 
saw my book at the right time. That's 90% of traditional publishing is like the right person who's going to be enthusiastic about your work, seeing it at the right time. Yeah. Well, now, and now that you've, you've talked about that and, and a lot of people kind of hedge around that question, but how did you, how did it happen that you met the right person at the right time? How did, how did it come up? Was it pure chance or were you querying like crazy or how did it happen? So um, I started off querying agents because I wanted an agent. You'd always get a better deal with an agent. They know better how to protect your rights, like especially as a first timer. But I had queried agents for about eight months and um, I had a couple of, oh, we're interested, but nothing ever came of it. And there's a lot of agencies. I just didn't, again, like find the right agencies. So after about eight months, I, at the time, Ace Rock, which is a, an imprint of Penguin, um, took direct submissions. They don't do that anymore, I don't think. But at the time, they did. So I was like, I'll submit to the slush pile, like, see what happens. So for the slush pile, they only took an inquiry, you know, the cover letter and uh, 10 pages. That was it. So I submitted the cover letter in the 10 pages and a week later I got a phone call from an editor saying, can you send the full manuscript? And I was like, sure, I'll send the full manuscript. And I was trying not to get excited about it, you know, because like lots of times I had heard they'll look at the full manuscript, but they won't necessarily pick the book up. Um, so I sent the full and a week later I was at Gymboree with my two-year-old son and I got a phone call from this editor offering me a three book contract. Wow. So, wait, wait. I just got to point that out a week later. That's so amazing. It was now, really, wow. <laughs> it was, that, that time frame is, is amazing. It was really bizarre because it was like I queried and two weeks later I had a contract. But that was definitely if Cam hadn't seen it at that moment, you know, like that was the right person, right time, you know, 90% of it is luck. What if somebody else saw it and didn't like it as much? Yeah. You know, well, and you, and you I mean, were submitting I, to a, to a slush pile, a slush pile, so to speak. And it's, it's, it's really unlikely that what happened with you is going to happen. So I guess it's kind of a, a good lesson that if you, if you feel like you should do it, just freaking do it because you never know what's going to happen. Yeah, that's well, definitely not the norm from, from what most people we've talked to have said. Um, last week, we talked with um, uh, we talked with Beth Cato and uh, uh, Weston Oaks, and they both, in their story of how they got published, they talked about, you know, submitting and writing short stories and working at it for years before landing that first deal. So, I mean, Tina, that's amazing. <laughs> it's, I mean, it, that's definitely more customary. Again, like I really think it like a lot, like I knew the book was good, you know, I'm not saying like I wrote, you know, great expectations, but I knew that the book was publishable. I could recognize that. And I think sometimes I think a lot of people don't submit because, you know, the fear that they'll get rejected. But I was always like, I'm going to get rejected. That's part of the process. So like, as soon as I finished the manuscript, I started sending it out the next day because I remembered being in grad school. And some of the other grad students were just like polishing and polishing, you know, the first four or five chapters of their novel that they never finished. Because if they finished it, they'd have to do something with it. And they didn't want to be told that somebody didn't want it. Yeah, I think that's part of what, what led to the rise of self-publishing, though, too, is people not wanting to go through the whole crushing submissions process and moving into just publishing their own stuff. What are your thoughts on that? Yeah, I mean, I've, I've never tried to self-publish mostly because, like, I don't have the stamina. Like, you guys do so much. Like, I can, like, I don't want to think about the cover art and, like, the marketing and the typesetting and all that stuff. Like, I would like someone else to do that for me. <laughs> so would I. <laughs> so would I. <laughs> I don't want to think about that either. <laughs> <laughs> I married a graphic designer, so that made it easier. I mean, yeah, I mean, like, I can't even design my own bookmarks. Like, I need assistance for that. So, like, there's no way, like, if I wasn't traditionally published, I probably would just keep submitting because I don't want to have to do, like, it is definitely a different level of commitment to self-publish, I think. Oh, oh yeah. yeah. LJ, how about you weigh in on this? Oh God. Yeah, no, I, um, I did things incorrectly in the beginning of my, um, I'm going to be generous and say my career, uh, just because 
uh, I got impatient. I didn't know how long the process would take for submitting and hearing back. And I, my first agent, um, it just didn't work out. Um, and I just got this false sense that if it didn't work out with her, it wasn't going to work out. So then I ended up self-publishing my first series. Um, so it's, it's this series that I held up. There's four books out right now. Um, and it's done really well for, for indie, but I, you know, once you publish it, um, you know, it's very rare that a, a traditional publisher is going to be interested, even if you do well, you have to be like, you know, low level of sales, like millions of sales for people to be interested. And by that point, it doesn't matter. So, um, yeah, it's, it's really hard though. So for this series, I've been lucky because it has done well. And so I've been able to sell with Bard's Tower, which is a celebrity bookstore that goes around to cons and um, I can sell my books there and I can be on panels. That's how I met you guys was because I was with Bard's Tower at Phoenix. Uh, so that's been really nice, but it's really challenging to work a full-time job plus try to market myself and, and do all this work with self-publishing. So I am working on becoming hybrid right now. I'm actually in a very unusual point. So um, I'm really scared to talk about it because it's really positive, but I'm scared that like because of the amount of rejection that happens in the world that if I talk about it, something bad will happen. It's really silly, but um, <laughs> so you know because I, you guys know, you guys know like that you, you can come so close, and um, it's just it's very it's just really tough in this world. But anyways, what I uh, what Tina was saying is it is really tough. I'm married to a graphic designer. It just worked out that way. So I'm really lucky that she can do a lot of my design and I don't have to worry about a lot of the things that other people do. And the marketing has been, I'm still evolving with that, but I've had a lot of friends help me with, you know, what to do. I've just changed my Amazon ranking by changing a couple keywords and stuff. Um, but it's, it's so time consuming. I don't want to do that anymore. <laughs> I, I'm ready for the next level, I think. So um, I have two books. This is uh, my YA novel that um, one big publisher has and is looking at right now, and the other one I don't have a physical printout of, but it, I swore that I would never, ever write a romance novel. I just was terrified of that, and I swore I would never write anything that bordered on erotica. And something yeah, just... <laughs> I, it's, I was embarrassed, I think. I, I think I just was like, I can't do that. <laughs> like, what would my mother think? And then I realized, like, as a 30-something year old, that all I want to do at the end of the day is, like, have be in bed by 9 o'clock and have a good, dirty book. So I was like, well, you know, I'm going to write that book. And I think that, you know, especially science fiction fantasy has been really tough. I don't know how, what your experience is with, uh, you guys, what your experience was with uh, science fiction fantasy, if you've written that and um, had a positive experience. But if you write like something like along the lines of Fifty Shades of Grey, something really spicy, people just get really excited. So I had, uh, and I'm sorry, I'll wrap this up real quick, but this is just such a great show, story because it shows the difference between when I asked for beta readers to read my my first science fiction fantasy series, Triarian, I had a handful of people and they loved it. It was great. Uh, when I had, when I asked for volunteers to read Shadowless, my YA novel that I'm trying to get, uh, you know, traditionally published, I had 15 people like really excited about reading that and they read it. It was good. When I posted that I had a science fiction fantasy erotica that was very spicy, and I posted it was on, on Facebook for like an hour, and I had 50 people contact me about that. 50. And I had to cut it off because I was like, all right, guys, that's enough. I had people secretly, it was all guys that were like secretly PMing me because they didn't want everybody else to know they wanted to read a romance novel. <laughs> um, so I was like, this is, why didn't I do this earlier? <laughs> you know? Uh, but yeah, I just, I, I don't, I'm tired, you know, I, maybe it's cause I just had a birthday or something, but like, I'm tired. I don't want to be, uh, you know, really having to push sales and do all this stuff anymore. I, I, I would like to be traditionally published. Um, I really enjoy being an indie and really connecting with fans and stuff, but it's a lot of work. And if you're not prepared for it, you're just going to get ground uh, pretty badly. Um, but the, the best to finish off with the erotica story, um, I was at uh, DragonCon recently, and I had lunch with a uh, senior editor for a, a major publishing company, and um, I I pitched her again the YA novel, and she was excited about it. But you know, it was, it was, it was okay. She was excited. She she took her copy, and um, then I asked if her publishing company ever published erotica, and her eyes got really big, and she said, "Do you have a novel?" <laughs> I'm like, "Well, in fact, I do." And she's like, I want it right now. And I'm like, well, 
you know, I haven't, the only person that's read this besides me is my wife. I usually like to have my beta readers look at it, then I'll send it to my agent, then we'll, you know, discuss revisions, then we might give it to, you know, an editor before I even consider that. And she's like, no, I want it right now. So I had to get out my phone and forward her <laughs> the email that I sent my beta readers for it. And it was just, so the difference between some of the other work, even though I feel very confident that, you know, it's quality work versus my now erotica, <laughs> I can't believe I wrote that novel. Um, it's just, it's interesting, the, the reception. Mm -hmm. So I'm hoping, and I, I swear this is going to embarrass my mother so much, but if I, <laughs> If I if my first novel that got traditionally published was my my sexy novel that would just be like the greatest story ever which I think she would explode so that, all that right pretty fantastic <laughs> I've talked too much now <laughs> I say it really illustrates the importance of um, if you pitch something at a convention or something like that to an editor or to an agent like don't just come with a, an idea you have to have your manuscript ready. Um, because like that could be your shot. And I know that a lot of writers will be like, well, I have this great idea and I have like the first three chapters and I want to get a contract. So I'll pitch. But if you don't have that manuscript ready, they, they don't want to talk to you. They want to know that you can finish the work. Yep. That's huge. Yeah. That's that kind of where I'm at right now. I'm, uh, most of my work is indie published right now, <clears throat> but I've got a novel that <clears throat> I've been working at for the last few months, getting it ready for the submissions process and pitching and and trying to get it ready to hopefully you know find an agent find a, a publishing deal with it and it, it's nerve wracking trying to make sure it's perfect trying to make sure that I you know I've dotted all my eyes crossed all my T's everything is where it should be because I want to be ready if I you know happen to go to a convention or something and say hey I've got this great idea and they say I, I want to see it bam there it is what Tina said I, I actually had physical copies that I was able to give to people um, so that was it's it's really huge to come prepared like that so well, and, and LJ I I totally hear what you're saying about being an indie um, I think that self-publishing has really opened up a great new world to a lot of people who may never have have even attempted to be authors um, in the past because you know they're very fearful of the rejection process and everything else we just talked about but it is an incredible amount of work and I think I'm in year six or seven of um, of self-publishing and and I'm exhausted you know I work a I work a full-time job as well and I really really enjoy writing but I think that everything else that came along with it really started to, to drag me down and I didn't mind the the cover art I thought that was fun I didn't mind you know going through and editing the manuscript so much or, or getting it sent off to people that wasn't that wasn't the bad part it's the constant trying to get that novel in front of someone who's actually going to pick it up and read it and that's a challenge it, it seems like especially now with millions of self-published books out there that it's it's really difficult to get someone to even take a chance even if you're you're giving them a book for a dollar you know something ridiculously cheap or three dollars um, just to get them to, to give it a chance and say hey you know I hated this book or you know what I really like this book I'd like to read another one either way I'd be I'd be happy with either but you know it's it's tough and so I, I feel like I'm in that same boat as you LJ I'm I'm ready to do something a little bit different you know I'm submitting to a couple small presses right now. Um, and hopefully that'll that'll go well for me. And I know that the burden won't be completely off my back, but uh, it'll be nice to have somebody else at bat for you as, as well. So I can totally hear that. And I think that those of us who have been doing it for a little while probably feel that, that same way. Um, you know, there are certain, you know, famous indie authors that we all know of now, like Hugh Howey, um, who, was remarkably successful and is now traditionally published as well. But yeah. his, his, his fame came to him after a lot of hard work. And now he's able to, to kind of live a, a good life and write the books that he wants and not have to worry so much about that day-to-day -day minutia that a lot of indie authors have to, have to struggle through. And I think that's what we'd all love to experience that. Um, yeah. But now that we've talked about India a whole lot. Wait, can, can we pause for one second? Just to, as a oh. contrast here, because we've got. No, Katie, we're not pausing. No. Yes. We're no. Pausing. Pause. 
All right, fine. Okay, All so right. we've got Tina here, and she's got, we were talking about before we even went on air, how her publisher in the UK versus in the US had different ideas on how to manage the book, um, specifically on the covers. And, and that's something that as an indie, we don't even think of half the time, that the different markets, you know, might, uh, they, they might appreciate different cover styles, different pitches. And I want to kind of highlight that for a second, that that's one of the benefits of having a publisher to handle these things. They know better than we do. And, and Tina, if you'd love to show off your book covers, I'd love to show our audience the contrast between them. Um, yeah, so my, my last three books, um, Alice, Red Queen, and Lost Boy, were all picked up by um, the UK publisher Titan in addition to my American publisher. And so I'm just going to show, um, so this is Alice. That's cool. Who, who um, was your American publisher, Christina? Um, so, uh, it, I'm, I've been under various imprints for Penguin Random House. So like I started off at Ace, um, now it appears I'm on Berkeley, <laughs> um, but, um, it's all under the, the Penguin Random House umbrella. Like they, they move you around on imprints for like some internal reason of their own. Um, so this is Alice. So this is the, the Penguin, basically the Penguin edition of, of Alice. Um, and when the UK publisher picked up the book, they said, um, we love the book, but the cover is too American, uh, which I thought was really an interesting bit of feedback. I was like, okay, the cover is too American. I don't really see like what makes it American, but they did. And they know their audience better than I do. So um, this is the UK edition oh, cool. of that which is like a lot different um, than the American version. Um, it's a lot more subtle. There's no blood. Um, <laughs> they, and just the contrast between the way that they, um, they sold the book. They used the same back cover copy, um, the same back cover copy from the American edition. It was literally just the cover art that was different. Um, and for the American edition, the marketing department was really, really concerned that um, because it was loosely, and I want to emphasize very loosely um, based on Alice in Wonderland, that people might think it was a YA novel or that it was a children's book. And that even though it says dark fantasy on it, um, that people would pick it up and um, be upset because it's, it has a lot of violence in it. And so from the perspective of the U.S. publisher, it was really about managing reader expectations. Yeah. And um, they were definitely much less concerned about that in the U.K. Um, the, this, again, happened with my most recent book, Lost Boy. Um, like, this is the American version. And, in fact, the um, my editor uh, described this book as Lord of the Flies meets Peter Pan. So oh, it's, love it. it's, 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 it's extremely, extremely <clears throat> dark. So the marketing department, this cover went through more iterations than any other cover that I've had. Um, the marketing department kept going back and saying like, we really need to emphasize that it's violent. Like they just kept adding more blood <laughs> to the cover. Um, well, it must be really violent. <laughs> <laughs> kind of want to read it now. <laughs> I, I do want to read it. I mean, I don't think, it, I mean, it's violent. I don't think it's that violent. But again, like, it was really like, we want to manage expectations. They were worried about what people would think. And so they just kept, like, adding blood to the cover. And then the UK version is this, which is, like, beautiful and subtle. There's no indication whatsoever um, that it's violent. Um, and... Again, they used the same, the same back cover copy uh, as the American edition, exactly the same. And um, the book actually has sold just as much in the UK as it has in the US, like numbers wise. And like, obviously the population is smaller in the UK. So like proportionately, the books are actually more popular in the UK, I think, than they are. But the really interesting thing about the covers, and just for reference, I'll show one more. So here's Red Queen. Red Queen doesn't. You you were telling us a story uh, 
off air before we we started about how you're preparing to go on a book tour in the UK and there's some oh, some yeah. differences like the books are just a lot more popular there and they don't seem to be as concerned marketing wise about like what readers might think of the book based on the cover art. I think that's that's what's really interesting. Um, they just sort of come up with what they think that the the best cover art is, whereas the marketing in the U.S. seems to be um, geared more towards like a certain impression or like managing reader expectations. Um, but the the covers, the U.K. covers, look to me <clears throat> at least. I don't want to say it because it might sound it might come out wrong. They seem more adult to me. They're they're more appealing. I, I really like the way the UK covers look, but they feel more adult to me, like something I would want to have on my shelf because it's beautiful. It's not just, you know, telling a story. It's it's a, a beautiful piece of artwork they've created with the layers. Well, you see, and I, I feel exactly the opposite. I, I feel like I I actually I like the UK covers a little bit better because I, I think they are beautiful. And I think that that's the point that we keep hitting on them is they they're gorgeous. Right. Um, and, but I feel like the UK covers seem, seem a little bit more poppy or, or when, and when I think of, you know, popular fiction now, I'm thinking of more YA because it seems extremely popular at the moment. Um, so I'm thinking they look almost more YA to me, whereas the American ones, I'm thinking, oh, cool, this is going to be a, a bloody story about, <laughs> about uh, Captain Hook. So I don't know. While I, while I like the UK ones better, I can I can kind of see where that's coming from. But maybe that's because I'm a you know middle aged American man, and that's probably right. They're, they're too American, apparently. So exactly. <laughs> demographic. Although I have had a lot of readers buy both covers, which okay. is really interesting to me. Um, I've had because you can usually get the UK covers on the book depository. Mm -hmm. And um, so I've had a lot of American readers who are like, I love both covers and they'll buy both. So yeah, and that's, and that's another thing we were talking about uh, off air is, is how gorgeous some of these foreign covers can be. And I'm trying to track down uh, covers from another of my favorite authors, uh, Victoria Schwab right now, because her foreign editions are spectacular and so are the American, but, um, but yeah, so it, it's, it's really cool to, to see the way the marketing departments in a, uh, in a big publishing house, work and and how in tune to the as you said demographics they really are because you said that the books do really well in america correct yeah they do yeah they do well in america but like but then overseas they're crazy good like nothing on the level of like what they've done in the uk i mean they do obviously they do well enough in america <clears throat> like i just got another contract for two more books so um you know they're, they're yes. happy with my sales but like there's nothing on the level of like what they're doing overseas. They're definitely much more successful overseas. But to go back to the point though, that, that we were making, having that marketing department behind you mm -hmm. being published with a, a larger publisher is definitely an advantage over, you know, at the Indies, you know, we, if we're doing our own covers, we're paying for our individual covers. We're probably not going to have a U.S. version, a U.K. version or whatever tailored towards each market. So it's it's kind of a disadvantage for us, you know, more of the struggles of being an indie versus having that power behind you to help push your books. Right. Talking about book covers, Katie, say something so you pop up on the screen a minute. Why? What's going on? Am I, have I gone black? <laughs> no, no. I just wanted to, <laughs> to get you to pop up there so I could see the covers behind you. Uh, Katie just redid the covers on, um, on her Chronicles of the Uprising series, and the new covers are gorgeous. At the same time, you invested a small fortune in doing that, didn't you? And nice, and to nice to because there's six there's books six in that books series, and series, only three are done. Yeah. Could you could you grab Dissension from behind you real quick? Yeah. But his book covers are extremely expensive. Um, I have my my wife is a photographer. I I do some photography as well, mostly for fun. Um, it did, it's her business, and so she helps me with uh, my book covers, oh. and I've also hired that out to other people, and one way or another you're spending a lot of time and money on, on getting something done. And when it comes right down to it, you're relying on your own judgment as a self published author on whether or not you're actually creating a cover that anyone is going to give a damn about. And really you, you don't know if you're not a marketing expert, if that's not your job, you're going to have a hell of a tough time knowing that. So 
Uh, but Katie, yeah, hold up those covers for us and say something. So can you see so, them? Can you see them? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So the, so one, the one that is in red is the red new York cover. New York I want to talk about these covers because Dissension was the, the first book of Katie's that I ever read. Um, and I went on to read the entire series um, because I, I absolutely loved it. I was a really big fan. And the original cover, um, I liked a lot. I thought it was really cool. It showed this badass female warrior with a big sword. I was like, oh, yeah, I, I like it. I like this kind of books, you know. Um, I like badass female warriors and swords. So I, I thought it worked really well. And then she came, She got this new cover, and she, she sent me the proof of it before she posted it. I was like, holy shit. Even though I thought the old cover was great, I, I had no idea just how good it could really be. And I think mm -hmm. that's the difference between that. There's just so many different levels of, of professionals in this, in this game. And I think that's the difference right there. We don't always know if we've got something that's good or crap or amazing. And I think the awesome thing about how you're publishing Tina is that you've got a, obviously a great team that's making incredible products for you. Um, and they've really done a fantastic job with it. What happens with my books, as far as um, the cover art is that my editor will say, oh, you know, do you have some ideas? And I'll say, yes, I think X, Y, or Z. Um, and sometimes those ideas will be really vague. Um, like when we did Alice, my editor and I talked about the kinds of covers that we liked and like really sort of simple graphic cover and how we wanted to give the impression that the book was, um, I guess for lack of a better word, like more literary, like they might shelve it in the, like with the general literature, not in the fantasy section. Cause we were trying to appeal to readers who, who wouldn't necessarily pick up a fantasy book. So then with that directive, she went to the art department and talk to them and then they go back and forth. Then there's like a whole process that happens. For Alice, my editor and the head of the art department did it completely between the two of them. Like there was no big team of people. For Lost Boy, because of the way they wanted to position the book in terms of marketing and publicity, marketing department got involved really early on in the process so there were like a lot of iterations of the cover with a lot of people weighing in but i wasn't one of them <laughs> okay. uh, well now we've we've talked a talked a little bit about the the publishing process and you know i, I realize we haven't talked a whole lot about um the books themselves. So can you tell me, since I know you have a lot of books, so I don't, I don't want to get into all of them because it'd be a little overwhelming, but Tina, could you, can you tell us about your, your newest book and, and what it is and why we should be reading it? It's uh, the true story of Captain Hook. It's a Captain Hook origin story. And um, I wrote it because um, like about six years ago, my kid was like really Peter Pan obsessed. And um, there was a lot of Peter Pan in my life for a while there. And um, the, all the times I was reading Peter Pan with him and watching Peter, various film versions of Peter Pan, I just kept thinking, why does Captain Hook hate this kid so much? Um, why does this pirate, this adult, um, want to kill this kid? And um, I just kept thinking about that question and um, I decided to write it to answer that question for myself. It's an excellent premise. Yeah. Yeah. I love it. I love it. And it's such a fascinating uh, story to begin with to, to be able to delve into. Um, yeah. It, but it's, it is not a kid's book. You were very clear about that, right? No, it is not like at best um, older teen, but I don't, I don't write books for young adults. I write books for adults. Okay. Awesome. So it'll kind of indulge the fantasy that we want, but with a, but still have the adult content that we want as, as well to I mean it has a, like a young protagonist I guess in the sense that he looks young but okay. he's not <laughs> he's an immortal child 
<laughs> well, well, Peter Pan's not the hero of this story, but Captain Hook, or before he was Captain Hook, was just Jamie, and he was one of Peter's lost boys. Um, but he's been on the island for a long time. Oh, fantastic. That's cool. I like it. I yeah, like definitely it. Definitely adding that one to the to be read list. Let's uh, <laughs> let's turn it over to LJ too and find out about her latest release and what's uh, how you did the covers. You said your wife was your graphic art graphic artist, right? Yeah. So she actually um, both of us have science backgrounds. So I have a BSN and she's got um, uh, a sci uh, science background, bachelor's in science. And uh, so she actually got her graphic design degree. I think it was like 2009. And so she started playing around with doing covers for me. And um, yeah, she uh, has evolved um, a lot. Um, or, and we formed a company actually together. Um, so we have a graphic design company. But it's really nice having a graphic designer as a wife. <laughs> so, can, you, can you hold up that your, your most recent book cover again for us? Actually, I'll show you the two versions, her original and how much she's evolved too. Hold on. OK, so this is the original version, which Oh, God help you if you find that on the internet. Yeah, her bit. And this is the version now. So. I like it. I, I yeah, like them both. So you can see how much she's evolved. Well, there's just a lot. Um, we can get into the subtleties of a, of a, a design work, but she's it's just great. So she's fantastic to work with. Um, but my latest release, uh, you said you wanted to know about that. It's kind of tricky since I've actually written eight books. I have only got four out, and I'm kind of holding off on – uh, so this series, like I said, the Triarian series has four books out. I actually have number five written and number uh, six uh, halfway through, but um, I'm trying to go the traditional route, so I'm having to be patient, which is very difficult with my other novels, and I don't want to do anything more with this series since everything ties together. So um, all my other books tie into this world as well, and I don't want to put out five, six, and seven until I know the fates of the prequels and the parallel novels. So. Um, and it's funny because when, when Tina, I was so happy to hear your rapid turnaround in, in weeks. Most of my friends, uh, one of my good friends, uh, Dave, he didn't hear back for four years for his novel that got published. So um, I, I was hoping to hear back for both my the Y novel and the the sexy novel. I was I was hoping to hear back in a year or two. So um, I, I almost hate to tell that story because I feel like it gives false hope. Like <laughs> no, no, <laughs> actually. <laughs> what I got, what I got out of it is, you just never know. Like you just yeah. kind of have to keep playing, and like laying your cards down. You just never know, like um, when something is amazing is going to happen. You know, something to to break everything. You know, break that. That's that's exactly what I got out of it as well. It's a it's a really inspirational story, especially yeah. for writers and aspiring writers out there who may be just too damn scared to to submit. You know what? Just just freaking do it. You know, yeah. you might get rejected a hundred times or hell, you could be like Tina and get picked up. And yeah. then all of a sudden, bam, Two you're weeks. a published author. But Two weeks. <laughs> at the same time, like, like I did submit to agents prior to that and I couldn't get an agent and I would have preferred to sell it as an agented submission because I would have gotten a better deal for my first time than I was able to negotiate for myself. Um, and I actually didn't get my agent until I was contracted for six books because they had gotten that first three book contract for me initially. And um, three weeks after Black Wings came out, they offered me three more books. So I, I was going to wait for the first book to come out and sort of see how the sales were and then see if I could get an agent and, you know, try to get a better deal for my next contract. But my editor called me and she was like, we want to offer you another contract right now. So... Um, I was afraid to say no. <laughs> well, I don't blame you. I, that's, yeah. I was afraid to be like, no, I'm going to look for an agent first, and then you guys can like work things out. So I actually had six books, you know, under contract. I had I had my first book come out, and like three weeks later, I had you know five more books under contract, and then I did a book signing with Chloe Neal. <laughs> Cause we were on the same publisher and I only had one book out at the time and we were talking and I mentioned I didn't have an agent. She goes, Oh, I'll put you in touch with my agent. And that was how I got my agent. You <laughs> have awesome. had a charmed publishing career. <laughs> it is yeah, so awesome. That is so cool to see. But yeah. that's what I'm saying when I say like right person, right time. Yeah. yeah. And like, 
And so right person, right time could be two weeks after you submit, or it could be two years. It could be five years. It could be whatever. And I promise you, though, that it is not um, a magic bullet once you're published because there's a lot that happens. There's a reason why I have a seven book urban fantasy series and then I've written these last three books which are very, very different from what I wrote before. And that was because they contracted for nine books and then they're like, the urban fantasy market really isn't what it used to be, so we don't want the last two books of the series. Mm. Well, so, and that's, well, you have a book, that, a series that's selling well, you have to like, publisher's standards for what sells well are not necessarily your standards for what sells well. <laughs> um, so you can have a series that's selling pretty well, but they're looking at the whole market and saying, mm, we just don't see the demand that we used to see. So I had to hurry and wrap up the series in one book. And then I was, you know, mordantly depressed because I was like, oh my God, like my career is over. What am I going to do? And I, I would cried for two weeks and then I said, okay, you know, I still have two books under contract with them because I was contracted for nine books. And so they said, just pitch us something. So I pitched my editor this wacky, completely different thing, which was Alice. And they're like, sure. So I had a chance to restart. And it took you two weeks to write the book, right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Everything happens in two weeks for you. <laughs> no, not Alice, not Alice. Alice is so, um, Alice is a super dark book, like, really super dark and yes. so I you are going to be one of my new favorites I think <laughs> I couldn't actually stay in that mental space um long enough to write it in like a bingy way um it was too like oh I understand yeah yeah so like that was a book that I actually paced myself on I think it took me I think it took like five months yeah to write. so okay. Can we talk about that for a second? Because that was one of the topics I wanted to bring up is uh, the, you know, the time to write a novel and finding that time for those of us who, you know, might have jobs or families or, or obligations that pull us in different directions. How long does an average novel take you to write? And when do you find that writing time? LJ, how long does it take you to write? Um... So with a full-time job, I can usually manage between 13 and 15,000 words a month. So it just mm -hmm. depends on. That's a lot. Uh, yeah. But um, so <laughs> I wrote down everything I did in the last three years as like, I'm not even joking. I have it posted here because I, I sacrifice sanity um right here so i never forget like i mean i i know you guys um can probably attest to this too that have other jobs like you have to sacrifice something so i just um i mean i've written two new novels revised for uh gotten short stories published um what else did i do uh, five short stories i don't know i've, I've done a ton this is the last three years so I, I would say for me to i can write two novels a year i think at this point, but and when, that, that was like that was pre. Um, I, my wife is forcing me to take a break. So, <laughs> well, usually when your wife is forcing you to do something, there's yeah. there's a pretty good reason. <laughs> yeah, she's like you. You forgot to have you forgot how to have fun, and that's really true. I don't know about you guys, but I got to a point where I was working every day, um, and I didn't know it was fun anymore because like I couldn't. I, I was so just driven to write novels and to complete them and yeah. to make good stories and, and work full time and be a good nurse and do all this other stuff. It just, I forgot. So. Hey, I know that when I write by hand um, in the size notebook that I use, I have um, about 250 words a page with my handwriting. So I can get a rough idea of how many words I have without actually typing it out. Um, I mean, it really depends on the book. I, I find that I like my contracts to have at least eight months between them. I had for a while contracts that were like six months apart and I was really crazed. Like I didn't enjoy that process because I didn't feel like I had enough thinking time between the books. Like a, just a huge part of the way that I write is um, letting my brain like do the churning in the background. So um, 
I, I don't outline. I like the process of discovery that you get when you write. So um, I always say that, like, if you read my books and you were surprised by something, I was probably surprised by it, too, because <laughs> I didn't know it was going to happen until I wrote it down. Um, so I... I like to have eight months, but that doesn't mean I'm writing for eight months. It doesn't even mean I'm writing and revising for eight months. It just means that I need that eight months to, eight months to think about stuff, think about and, stuff and then write it down. Then and write it down and no, that that makes sense. I used to I used to work uh, pest control for a couple of years, and I had a uh, just a yellow legal pad that I would bring with me in the truck and. Every morning before I started working, I'd go to this particular restaurant and I'd have some eggs, which I found out I'm allergic to, which kind of ruined my entire life there. Um, but anyway, I'd have eggs and coffee and I'd, and I'd just sit there and kind of zone out for a half an hour or so before work. And sometimes I'd end up with a couple pages written. Other, other times it'd, it'd just be a, a little bit of dialogue here and there. And just because... I'd have to completely zone out and, and be lost in this world in, in order for the the ideas to even come to me. So, but yeah, I, I like that idea of giving your brain a certain amount of time just to, to play around with what it's trying to create before you actually try to do the writing. Why are you doing that? I, I just think that you need the time um, to, and, and also, it, like, when I actually do the writing, it makes it easier because I've done some thinking about the book and um because I don't like to outline every single plot point it just means like okay I you know I know roughly what's going to happen next I don't ever like have writer's block I get that it's like the the best ideas always come to you in the shower you know when you're not actively sitting at the desk writing and you can just let your brain kind of figure it out on its own and then by the time you're ready to sit down and actually do the writing you've got that scene already in mind and you can just bang it out quickly. Right. And like I run long distances. I, I've run um, four marathons and I've run a bunch of half marathons. So like I like to just go out and sort of run and then like it's just like meditation basically. I don't like think actively like, oh, I want X, Y, Z to happen. I just sort of let my brain do its thing. I totally get that. I, but I'm also a pantser too. So it's that's kind of the process. I don't understand... The people who can do those massive outlines, I admire them, but I just can't understand how they can do them and then hold to them. Because anytime I ever plan for something to happen in my book, it always changes. And I was actually talking to Victoria Schwab this year, and she's like a total outliner. And we've written about the same number of books. And she's like, you are crazy. How do you even do that? And I'm like, you are crazy. How do you even do that? Like, we really don't understand. But I think it's such a demonstration of how the process is so personal for everybody. Like, you know, whenever people say like, oh, do you have advice for new writers? I'm always kind of like, figure it out. Because <laughs> <laughs> that's really what it is. You have to figure out what works for you. Oh, absolutely. And, you know, that whole plotter versus pantser thing. There's like a hundred shades of gray in, gray in between there. You don't have to identify as one or the other. You just figure out, like you said, you said what works for you. It took me, I think, 32 years or so to write my first book because I was I was one of those one of those students that was always write, always writing a novel but never finishing a novel. And I, I always it was my it was a bucket list kind of thing. It was a far off dream, and never thought it would actually happen. So. So finally, I got my ass in gear and actually wrote one, and then I finished one a year ever since then. And now I've slowed down considerably. You know, I used to say, okay, a thousand words a day, you know, that's that's what you're going to do when you're going to sit down and actually write it. But there's so much more to life <laughs> than just working all the time. And um, yep. even writing is wonderful. It's It's still work. So yeah, so I've really scaled back. I'm writing short stories this year, and I'm gonna put together a little anthology of short stories that'll probably go out next year. But um, instead of doing a thousand words a day, I may be doing one or two thousand words a week. And while I don't see the production that I did before, I'm I'm certainly enjoying life more now. So and I think that there's a lot to be said for our quality of life. Now, Katie, you you pound out books like crazy. What's your average looking like now? I don't know. This last one that I've been working on has taken me a while because I've slowed down because I'm intending this one to be um, more traditional than indie. I, I've kind of 
paid closer attention to its marketability. So rather than just pounding out the words and then quick revising them and sending them off to my editor, I've really taken time with the beta readers and I've been going in layers and layers with this one to try and make sure that I've been hitting different targets and different marks. I know, Jason, I sent you section one and section two. I have not read section two. And it's not because I don't like it. It's because I, I forgot that you sent me section two until 10 seconds ago. Your rabbit brain. <laughs> but each section comes with questions at the end so that I can make sure I'm hitting those targets. So my usual, you know, thousand words a night goal has kind of slowed down because I'm really focusing on each individual chapter. But normally I do aim for about three to four books a year. Wow, that's impressive. How, how long are your, your books? It depends. Um, the Chronicle series are all shorter. They're mm -hmm. about 50,000 words each. Mm -hmm. The Immortalis series was between sixty and 80,000 words each, and the Little Werewolf series fluctuated wildly. The last <laughs> one was 80,000 words, and the first one was 50,000 words, and I think the second one was closer to 60,000. <laughs> Stop it. Sorry, Katie. She's trying to make out with me. She's the star of the show, I told you. <laughs> So how long were the was the Immortalis series average? Sorry, I totally interrupted your talking. Um, Immortalis series was closer to eighty thousand each. Okay, okay. I seem to be. I I seem to like right around seventy thousand words. That seems to be. That seems to be where where I go. Um, I don't know if I just I don't have the attention span to go much longer than that, or if I just I kind of like shorter novels. I like reading shorter novels myself. Um, you know, a, a good, thick, epic book is fun, but I also like to be able to complete it in a timely manner, you know, maybe a week or two rather than months. Um, just because I've got to work and I have a family, I don't have a zillion hours to de devote to reading all the time. But Well, thank you guys for joining us for another episode of Spilling Ink, the talk show that takes you behind the scenes in the writing and publishing world. This has been Jason Lavelle with my lovely assistant, Bella. Bella the Dancing Bird, who loves attention, and Katie Salaitis. And we want to thank both of you, Tina and LJ, for hanging with us and telling us about your experiences. Thank you, guys. It was awesome. Yeah, thank you so much for having me. Yeah, yeah we'll, we'll it do it again. Our pleasure. Sometimes. We'll see you guys next week. Thank you so much. Good night.